everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, my name is Lewis. I'm a designer and a front end developer. Um, that means I do twice as much work as everyone else. Um, I work for a company in the UK called Wonder. Um, it's known in Europe as Wonder Kraut, but um, in the UK it's just called Wonder. Um, I am part of the UX team for Drupal. Um, I also maintain Seven, which is the default admin team that ships with Drupal. And I also maintain all the CSS in Drupal, which is a recent thing. I'm not sure why I agreed to that. Anyway, um, so about a month ago, I traveled to uh, Minneapolis to take part in a usability study for Drupal 8. Um, it was around the time of the Drupal camp, uh, camp Twin Cities, and a lot of us Okay, so a lot of us got together um, around the University of Minnesota um, to test Drupal 8's usability. Um, and you can see there's loads of us who came, uh, some people came from the world, Boyan, some of us who's the UX lead, who came from the Netherlands, um, Nick Rosenkranz and Link Swanson at the back, uh, they work for the university. Um, Andy Byron, everyone will know is web chick, he came along, and uh, Ivan Sayek, he lives in, um, he lives in Minneapolis and he helps organize the whole thing and get everything uh, going. Uh, it was also sponsored by a lot of organizations. Uh, Wonder and Acrea and Tank7, Triplo, uh, Tag1, they all helped finance this, uh, bring everyone together, pay for their tickets, pay for their time to be there, um, which was like not a small expense. And the University of Minnesota did a lot for us, helping facilitate and provide all the equipment and stuff that we needed. So thank you for that. Um, the stuff they provided to us is they gave us a, a formal testing lab uh, to be able to test um, everything fully. And this includes like um, the screen recording, it uh, includes eye tracking software, um, cameras everywhere so you can see like the person's face. And you can also see like if they were using their phone to do some tasks, which we got them to do. Uh, there were cameras in the ceiling that would go over their shoulder to show exactly where they're tapping. Um, and there's also um, the one-way glass mirror. Uh, which is soundproof, which turned out to be quite handy. So why are we testing Drupal 8 now? Um, so we want to understand um, what people think of Drupal 8 and what they expect it to do. Um, we also want to validate the improvements that we've already made from Drupal 7 to Drupal 8. Uh, and we want to find issues that we can fix before Drupal 8 comes out, and also start thinking about the stuff that we can fix uh, Drupal 8.1, Drupal 9, and maybe get ahead of ourselves this time. Um, and this is the first time we've tested Drupal uh, before we've released it. So we tested Drupal 6 a long time ago, and that went terribly. Um, and then after we made loads of improvements, uh, we tested Drupal 7 after it came out. So this is, a, um, this is the first time we've ever done it before the version has actually come out and everyone starts using it. So um, we had some methodology and demographics um, we wanted um, people who were familiar with developing for the web. Uh, they had some experience with HTML or CSS, um, maybe a little bit of PHP, and maybe some experience with WordPress and Joomla. Um, quite a few of the participants had used Drupal 7 before. Um, and then we had to come up with a load of scenarios of um, things that we wanted to test. And this would, uh, we use this to develop the scripts that we'd ask them to do. So really basic stuff that you expect to do in Drupal, creating content. Um, adding a link to a page, um, creating content types, and adding fields, and then creating um, creating like content from those content types on a mobile device, um, and then placing a block. Uh, we also actually asked them to test the in-place editing feature that's in Drupal 8, but no one found that feature, <laughs> which isn't great. Um, so we actually didn't manage to test any one of that, even though we are trying to like push them towards it. Imagine if you could do this, and they couldn't imagine how they would do that. So that didn't go well. Um, we also had a Drupal help desk. Um, we had someone sitting behind the, behind the mirror um, who was by the phone. <laughs> if they got really stuck, um, they could call up, and you'd be like, oh, hello, this is a Drupal help, help desk. How can I help you today? Um, and then they would, um, they, would tell them, like, they would tell us what they were trying to do, and we'd try and push them towards the right place. So if they got really stuck, which a lot of people did, and we could kind of give them a nudge without telling them what exactly what they had to do. Exactly what they had to do. 
Um, this, so when this is going on, we're behind the one-way mirror um, in this dark room with no windows or anything. Um, and we're uh, watching everything that's going on, we're observing, and we're noting down everything that was happening in this Google Doc. Um, it was a really cool system and spreadsheet that the university had set up, where everyone could take notes and everything was timestamped, so you could go back and find the important uh, points and the difficult points. And um, all these uh, Google Docs are actually opened up. Anyone can view them, you can copy them, you can use them yourself. Uh, if you want to find the links to those docs, I can give them to you. Um, we actually haven't finished writing up the post, the big post about everything in this session. So the links will be in there um, once that's written up. Um, oh yeah, so what we did um, with this Google Doc is as we were typing, they, we identified some of these issues um, down the side. And then afterwards, um, we assessed how difficult or like how big a problem those issues were on a scale of one to five. So one would be that the participant noticed something was wrong, but it didn't really affect them in any way. And five would be just like a complete block. They had no idea how to proceed, or they're just really frustrated. So we had a few of those as well. Um, and then at the end, um, at the end, on the third day, when we had no um, tests to run, we spent the whole day going through every single problem we found and trying to suggest um, recommendations that we can make to fix some of these problems. Try and find ones that are low-hanging fruit, ones that we could fix before Drupal 8 comes out. Um, but we also thought a little bit about the bigger picture, what we could do if we had unlimited time and stuff like that. Um, yeah, this is the stuff we're doing when we're there, just like thinking of ideas, brainstorming, um, and it helped to be all together in one room because um, like Boyan and Angie were there and they have a really like deep history of everything that's happened in the UX of Drupal and there are people there who are developers as well and they could like give hints if this is doable before uh, Drupal 8 comes out or if it's not. Uh, so I'm going to talk about some of the things that went quite well. The first one is mobile. So in Drupal 7 there was no mobile support in the admin interface at all. Um, it was basically impossible to use. And I think one of the first things I did um, at a DrupalCon, the first time I contributed was I ran a usability test on um, Drupal 7 for mobile users. And it was just impossible to do anything. Um, when we got rid of the overlay, it did make it a lot easier um, because that was uh, that caused a lot of the problems, but you can see that we've like kind of restyled it to the admin team, um, and it's a lot easier to use, and no one really had any problems on a mobile device. So we feel good about that. <laughs> uh, another thing that was great was the WYSIWYG in Drupal 8, uh, which is pretty amazing that we have one uh, built into Drupal 4 now, and everyone used this without a problem, as you expect, like it's kind of a standard thing. They expect the WYSIWYG to act in, like, in a way that that we would say use before um, act, and that wasn't a problem, so great. Um, oh, another thing that tested quite well was the insert image dialogue, um, which is out of the box in core, you can insert images. Um, it's not particularly smart, uh, but it works like no problem. Um, okay, so something else that tested really well is the content preview. Um, so what you can do now in Drupal 8 is you can preview your content as it will look on the front end your front end theme. Um, and in Drupal 7, you couldn't do that when you hit preview. It just showed you the content in the admin theme, and it was kind of useless. So now you can go um, um, and show how it looks in Bartic, and then you have the toolbar that says go back to your page. And everyone used this, no problem. We thought there might be a danger that people would view it, and they think they've saved their content, and then just go click away and do something else, and then they lose their content. But that didn't happen to anyone, so that's good. Um, another thing we have, a really cool feature, is um, the autocomplete uh, feature where you're adding a link. So before in Drupal 7, when you're adding a link to a page, you'd have to know the URL of the page in your mind. And you'd have to, if you didn't know, you'd have to go back to the page, you know, copy it, and then go back to this page that has a link, and then paste it in. What you can do now in Drupal 8 is you can start typing the title of the page, and it will autocomplete a list for you, and you can just select it, and then you've done your link. It's pretty amazing, you know, uh, top stuff. And people actually found this feature. We thought that maybe they wouldn't find it because they didn't know they could just type anything in there. Uh, but they found it, and that was good. Um, something we did when we redesigned the 7 theme in Drupal 8 is we moved these um, tabs on the right-hand side, and we moved them along to the left. The thing that we found during the studies for Drupal 7 is that people kind of ignored these. 
because they're over here and they're all kind of looking on the left hand side, looking stuff over there. And they actually struggled to find these tabs um, when they first started using Drupal. So we moved them over uh, to the left hand side and no problems there. We fixed that problem. Great. Oh, yeah, yeah. And that's how it looks now. Um, they're all aligned to the left. And that's the problem that we fixed. Uh, something, like another really good feature that we added to Drupal 8 is inline form errors. So now when you create an, uh, when you, you know, you submit a form and then there's an error on the page, instead of the errors appearing at the top, they all appear in line next to all the uh, form items. And this is a really big usability improvement. It's a great accessibility improvement. It was a huge issue that took ages to get in. Um, so being able to give this kind of feedback to the community of developers who work so hard on it, and they can see that like it's improved stuff already, and we can validate that, that's why doing stuff like this is really valuable. Um, so that's it. Nothing else to report. Everything went really well, and everyone loves Drupal 8. Thank you very much. Wait, no. <laughs> Sorry, that's not the end of the presentation. Yeah, you have to stay a little bit longer. Everything I, is working. Yeah, everything's great. <laughs> it works fine. Um, no, now I have to do the bad stuff. Uh, the stuff that didn't go so well, and there was some stuff. So the biggest problem is that Drupal uses terminology that no one, well, that no one who's never used Drupal before understands. So you have the concept of blocks, regions, nodes, queues, um, and most people just don't know what these mean. Uh, we had quite a lot of people say stuff like this. In WordPress, you don't have to figure out how to place your blog inside your view, inside your region, inside your home page. Uh, this was a big blocker for a lot of people who started to use Drupal. They just didn't know where to go. They didn't know what a content type was, so they couldn't create a content type. Some people, um, well, there's one person who actually tried to uh, create a contact form because they, they thought, oh, I want to make a form on the page that people can submit content. Oh, it's a form creator. So they started building something there, and we had to try and reel them back in. Um, but they just struggled to do basic stuff. Um, some people said stuff like this, like, what's a drop down? What's a checkbox? Um, that's why it's called an HTML. So people were kind of thinking about um, building forms in, like, from the front end. So when you think about the different form types in HTML, you think about select boxes, radio buttons, um, you know, text boxes, stuff like that. But Drupal doesn't start with that. It takes a back-end centric approach. So you create your data structure first, and once you've done that, then you start building like, and then you can like choose the widgets and stuff, and then you can, you finally build the form eventually. Um, and most people didn't think in that way. Um, so they are approaching it in a way that just Drupal doesn't approach it either. And it really confused them. Um, actually, like one of the harshest things that someone said is that if all you use is Drupal, you're not going to be able to make any other kind of website because there's so much stuff in there that is just Drupal logic. Um, it's not really applicable to how other like frameworks use, um, like how you build stuff on the web. Um, so that was a bit harsh. Um, so how do we fix this huge problem of like Drupal using strange things? So we had an idea of before Drupal 8 comes out, we could have like an intro screen or something like that that would kind of introduce the concepts of this is a content type. You use it to you know, create forms that people can enter content into. This is a field. These are what fields do. These are blocks. These are regions. Um, and that wouldn't be too difficult to do. Um, and it's possible before release. Um, I don't think it's actually made much progress in the HTTP so far. Um, but the real fix is actually going through and fixing all the words so they make sense. Because a lot of other CMSs just don't have this problem. And Drupal has like. Uh, is that a little bit of a disadvantage where it tries to be so flexible that it just abstracts all this stuff out? You can't really say, like, create a page because all content types could be, you know, it could be any kind of thing. It doesn't have to be a page. Um, so figuring out how to make it more accessible to people who have never used Drupal before is a challenge when we try and balance it with, like, Drupal being very flexible. Uh, so that's where there's a Drupal 9 problem. Uh, the next thing we ask someone to do is just to place an existing so um, we had this scenario where, we, we, where the people were um, creating a website for a conference, um, and we wanted a box on the left-hand side in the sidebar that shows people who, were, um, who have recently registered for the conference. And this was difficult. Um, so again, the same problem occurred. Um, straight away, people were thinking about it in a front-to-back way. So 
they went to their home page and they're like, oh, I want to add something to this home page. I want to add something to the sidebar. Um, but the problem is, like, what they try to do is click on these links, so the contextual links in the sidebar, and they wanted to find a link there that just said, like, add block here. Because, you know, if, if they're looking at the sidebar, that's where they seem to be able to interact with it. And they couldn't do that. The way that Drupal works is you have to go to another page somewhere else, under structure, under block layout, and here you find your regions again. And then you have to figure out which one is the region that matches up with that page. Um, and then you add stuff there. So um, this is the new design for the block layout page in Drupal 8. Um, it's changed a lot compared to how it was in Drupal 7. We had to um, we had to support this new system we have where blocks are uh, plugins, which means that you can place as many types of a block into different regions in different situations. So if you've ever used Drupal 7 and you've used the context module, which allows you to put blocks in multiple places in different contexts, um, this stuff is baked into Drupal 8 now. Um, so you can do that kind of stuff out of the box. Mm. It's very awesome. But it meant that we had to redesign the whole thing because before we had um, uh, we had all the blocks like at the bottom and then you could drag them around. But if you can have like, let's say you can have like the user login block as many times as you wanted, you had to have a new system for adding them. You can't just have like a billion of them at the bottom. Um, so this was kind of a problem. I have a uh, an, an example of uh, someone trying to add a block. Yeah, here we go. And so then um, I want to place it on the home page. So I want to go into uh, structure. And then I want to choose block layout almost here. And um, scrolling down to look for the block I just created. So this participant had experience with Drupal 7. Um, and they actually created a view um, to show like recent users. And you can see this, like recent, and these blocks are right there. Okay. Well, I have to fast forward a little bit, because this goes on for a while. Um, this is why the, the soundproof glass is really useful. Uh, yeah, so he finds this page about custom block libraries. Uh, there's nothing there. So one, uh, one participant even said, like, this isn't much of a library. It's empty. Yeah. So at one point, the, uh, Nick, uh, who was our facilitator, um, he asked him to step in. Yay! 
So, um, so you could maybe think that because he has experience with um, Drupal 7, that that kind of influences where he's looking for stuff. But almost everyone we tested this with couldn't find those blocks on the right hand side. It was like it just didn't exist. Do you have a question? Could it possibly be that because it's on the right hand side, and I guess most of your users are used to reading left to right, they were starting on the left? So, because they couldn't find it on the left, because that's where you start, mm -hmm. it just didn't get any further. Is, is that logical? Yeah, it, in a way it is, because if you think about the conventions of a lot of websites, like if you think about Facebook, they put all their ads and stuff on the right hand side, so it kind of becomes like, you've kind of trained users of websites, this is where useless stuff is. And <laughs> this is where the non-important information is. The really important information is on the left hand column. And actually, in, um, uh, we redesigned the contact, no, sorry, the create um, content pool in Drupal 8, and we put all the, um, we, we put all the important fields, like the fields you define in the content type on the left-hand side, and then all the metadata, like the, um, the URL stuff and the meta tags and the revisions information on the right-hand side, because we're telling people that this stuff isn't as important as your main content fields, because a lot of people used to go through and they thought they had to fill out all this other information that wasn't important. So what we've done is we've kind of reused that here. But actually, the difference is on this page, this stuff is really important. Like it's the most important thing on this page is where the blocks are that you can add. And so we've kind of reused this layout, um, but in a completely different situation where actually like the really important stuff's over there. Um, so that was a big problem. So people kind of looking at it like this, like everyone was doing this, and we were kind of screaming at them there's a look on the right hand side. And that example that I had, like, he actually figured out eventually, but some people never figured this out. This was like impossible to do. And it's one of the basic things that you do with Drupal, right? It's placing blocks. And very few people could achieve this task. Could you not just resolve that with some basic labels? Um, yeah, we were thinking of maybe putting a big pink arrow saying, look over here. Um, yeah, we had like, came up with loads of ideas. And I can actually show you uh, what we've done because this issue was so, like it was such a big problem for so many people that it was like the highest priority thing that we found to fix. So we've actually fixed this now already in Drupal 8. Um, oh yeah, sorry. So one other problem is that people were scrolling and looking at these regions and they wanted to add stuff to those regions. They could see them um, and they were like, how do I add something here? And they couldn't, they weren't looking over there. So that was a problem as well. Not so much in the example I showed, but for other people, that was a big problem. So, this is how the new bot layout page is. We've gotten rid of the right hand side thing. Um, and now, next to each region, here you can see there's a button. Can you see that, okay? Yeah, you can see there's a button. By each region, it says space block. So, it kind of flips closer to how the users are expecting the page to work, because they find the regions that they want to add to, and then you can add stuff to it, um, which is a little bit closer to how they're expecting it to be. And we still don't have a link on the front end yet to say add a block here. And there's an issue for that, but that's a little bit trickier. And so once you click on that place block, um, then it shows you the, the block library of stuff you can add. And you can't miss this. This is you know a lot easier um, to find <laughs> right in the middle of the page. Um, so that works fine, and then you can just add the block as you did before. Um, so the next thing we ask people to do is to create a content type and add some fields. You know, a, a pretty major task um, with a Drupal site. So the first problem that people had is they just didn't know which field type to choose. Um, they spent loads of time just on the um, add a field page, scrolling through all the selections, and they didn't know which uh, which ones were important and which ones weren't. So I have I have a video. I don't know like again like with the other one. It takes a little while. So let's see how this goes.
group late, we've added loads of fields to calls. Um, the, idea, the idea being that you can um, do more with core out of the box. You don't have to wait for all these modules. But what it means is we've made the add a new field listing huge. So Oh, so he's looking to add a field so you can create a drop down with a list of session tracks for a conference. So he wants like some kind of list. Um, so you can see like the text ones, we have like about six different kinds of text fields. And they all have really strange names like text long, text formatted long, um, and stuff like that. Okay, so basically he ends up selecting um, the right one, but he's really unsure about what to do. Um, okay. I think I might just be running into um, limitations of my site building knowledge here, also. So I'm just going to have to go on the exhibition and do this, and then call this session track. Drupal is using very weird terminology that people don't understand, and it's com coming, um, it's like you're building funnels from a back-end perspective again. Like, um, you have to define the data type before you define what it looks like, and this guy was looking for a way to make a drop-down, and he just couldn't find the word drop-down anywhere. Um, so yeah, again, it's the same thing, like people were looking for like um, text area, image, upload, tags, and Drupal just doesn't think in that way. It expects you to think like from the back-end forward. Um, yeah. Yeah. So the biggest problem here is that the, the listing is really confusing. You can see like we have like text plain long, text formatted long with summary, formatted, formatted long, text plain, and it's not really clear what these do. Um, you can also see that like at the very top, you need to put like the really important stuff that people use all the time at the top, so they can find it easily. The first thing we have is boolean, and it's and like we had just like a general list, which is basically just random like things that we didn't know where to put anywhere else. And the really important stuff is at the bottom. And one participant actually Googled the word Boolean because she thought it was really important. Uh, so she went up to figure out what that was. And she was like, oh, I, I think I have to know what this is. So she spent some time reading about that. Um, one of the other issues we had. Um, sorry. Oh, sorry. Is there some consequence of the finding? The consequence of that problem? Yeah. Yeah, so it was a mix. Or is that coming up later? Um, the consequence of the switch. Oh. Will it, will it be <coughs> more? Yes. Yeah, I'll get to that. Okay. Don't worry. Um, but one other problem with the whole field listing thing is that we've added um, entity reference into core. Um, so in order to maintain like the consistency that we have with seven, um, there's like you can choose taxonomy term reference in like the field types, but that's actually just linking to like a entity reference type. And so when you add it. It goes to the field setting for entity reference, and it just pre-selects the taxonomy term one for you. So it just kind of maintains, like, it kind of abstracts it out, so you can, if you were thinking like a taxonomy term before, you can find it easily. But as soon as you go to the second page here, it just asks you again to put it in. And everyone got really confused at this point, because they're like, well, I just asked for a taxonomy term. Why is it asking me again? Do I have to, fill, do I have to change it? Should I choose something else? Um, so that confused a lot of people. Um, and then when you go back to your listing, it says entity reference. And one of the participants, the sub participants was saying like, well, I, I didn't add an entity reference. Where does this come from? And they didn't know what it was. Uh, so having like this, this weird mix of naming for what is basically just an entity reference really confused a lot of people. Um, so I was surprised that they even knew what it was, but I guess the term like entity reference doesn't really make sense to a lot of users. 
Um, so like a possible solution we can have is to add like a, a dialogue uh, that allows us to give a little bit more detail. So like the views uh, UI has, um, instead of just throwing like a drop down, we can have like the title, and then we can have like a little bit of information, say like this maybe like this can present the information in a, in a drop down select list, um, it can be in radio buttons, and it gives people a little bit of a clue before they select it, um, what it does and how it's going to look later. Um, and that's kind of a short term thing that we might be able to do, but like the long term thinking is that you just like we can actually build a proper form builder in core. So you could just drag over like different uh, widgets, and you could choose the type of data they are. But this is like big Drupal nine stuff. It would be awesome if we could do this kind of thing. But you know, this will take years. Uh, it was kind of a little bit at the end. It was a little bit depressing, like thinking of all these solutions. And then thinking how many years of work we've created for everyone to do this <laughs> stuff. Uh, but it was still fun. Um, OK, so one of the other problems that we had uh, was that the home page wasn't very distinctive. Um, so there's two pictures here of Barbie um, after one piece of content has been added. And one of them is the home page, and one of them isn't. The left one, yeah. Pretty much. So the, the, like, the biggest. Signifier is that the home tab is white. Um, but this actually confused loads of people because they created their first piece of content about the latest trends in anti top technology. And then they um, and then they they didn't understand where they were anymore. They thought that um, they thought when they went back to the home page that this piece of content um, had become their home page. They thought like this wasn't a listing of content, they just actually thought it was the whole page. And they and they got really confused. They thought, I never said this is my homepage. What's going on? Um, so this was like, I never, we never come across this problem before. Um, and it's probably like a, just a design issue. But also it's kind of like a content issue. Like there aren't many websites nowadays that just show like a listing of news as their homepage. Like uh, when you, when you brief up other CMSs and they give you default content, uh, Squarespace looks like this. And you can kind of imagine that most a lot of websites now look like this. The so Drupal still gives you like a very like gives you like a news listing as your homepage, which is really kind of dated. So maybe part of it is design, but part of it is maybe like thinking how we could redesign like a homepage in a style that makes sense for people, like it fits with their expectations of what a homepage should do. Um, so that's like a just an overview of some of the problems we found, um, just like the really big major ones. Uh, we actually found about 140 problems. Or issues, um, and we spent most of the time after that just getting all those issues into the issue queue and stuff. Um, so if you want to help, uh, there's a meta issue on Drupal.org, and um, that contains every issue that's been created. Um, but we also made a tag, which is a uh, UMN uh, 2015, which is the University of Minnesota. Um, and that's that's everything. Thank you. <laughs>
so that's why. Yes? I just going to ask, I mean, one of the problems when you start to say the terminology is that that's also to do with culture and language. Mm -hmm. And so it would be really interesting to see something like this done with Europeans or Asians or South Americans or whatever. Yeah, in, that's true. And, and to sort of flesh out, you know, does everyone have the same problems? Probably not. Yeah, that would be interesting. Uh, I guess it also depends on uh, the quality of the translation <coughs> in, uh, in Coral as well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think like, if we get to a point where the primary language of Coral is good, then we have an opportunity to go and yeah. other languages. I mean, even, but it's not just about translation language, it's about culture. I think it was, so the University of Minnesota were the ones who are recruiting um, the participants. And the reason they haven't uh, a vested interest in Google is because they use it internally. Um, so I think they sourced quite a few people who worked there, yeah. and they had some experience with previous fields before. But we tried to find some that, you know, just have general web experience, because that's also really useful. Yes? I was just taking a look at the meta issue, and there's some criticals that don't have like, issues created for them. Yes. So like a timeline for that? Um, OK. Uh, so we had to have like a different, we had like UX critical and Drupal issue queue critical, because that they mean two different things. Like your standard usability critical means that someone can't progress, uh, or they're really frustrated, and they can't get anywhere. In some situations, that's not a Drupal critical. That's just part of the definition of the issue queue and how it works. So some of those ones aren't super high priority for the project, um, even though they are big issues. Like the terminology issue is critical. Like some people can't find the content types page. Uh, but that's not uh, blocking the release. So that's never going to be labeled a critical in the issue queue. Does that answer your question? Yeah. I don't know about the timeline for creating all those issues. I think everyone was kind of burnt out after a whole week of doing this stuff. Yeah. Uh, the designs were participating in the test. Uh, what, what kind of, were they interested in being in the field? Were they just random people? Uh, they weren't from a particular industry, not that I remember. That wasn't, um, we didn't specify anything like that. situation that makes a lot of sense and we're using it now in the block uh, layout workflow because it makes a lot of sense because you're returning back to that page and you want to place the block in those regions. Um, but the overlay, the overlay module is gone from Drupal 8. Okay. Yeah. okay then, thanks for coming everyone. <laughs>